hello everybody. Welcome. Everybody slowly coming into the Zoom room. I can see some names filling up. Uh, welcome to the Sustainability Speaker Series. This is a series that happens once a month we, with, in partnership with the Saskatchewan Environmental Society and the Saskatoon Public Library. My name is Megan. I'm a programming librarian here at the Saskatoon Public Library. Uh, we are recording this session, this presentation, and it'll be posted on our YouTube page. Uh, you and your presence, your name, and uh, any questions you ask will not be part of the recording. Um, and if you have concerns about that, please reach out. Uh, but we're, we're very careful about keeping people's anonymity in this room intact. Uh, yes, welcome to Treaty 6 territory. Technically, we're all in our own physical spaces. So my apartment here is located on Treaty 6 territory. So I acknowledge that I am coming from that perspective in that place. Um, and trying my best to uphold my treaty obligations as I've agreed to. And if you need to use the washroom during the presentation, you'll find it located probably close to where you are. Um, just step out into the hallway if you need to and uh, make sure that your mic and your video is turned off. And without any more housekeeping, I am going to turn it over to Carol from the SES and she'll introduce our tonight's speaker. All right. Uh, good evening. Uh, welcome to the Sustainability Speaker Series event for March. Uh, I'm a volunteer with the Saskatchewan Environmental Society. The uh, Saskatchewan Environmental Society delivers uh, education, undertakes research, and carries out uh, demonstration projects that move us toward sustainability. We've been operating since 1970 on important issues such as sustainable energy and climate solutions, water protection, biodiversity preservation, and reduction of toxic substances in our environment. If you're not already a member, we encourage you to join. You can always find out more about our diverse projects, activities, and how to get involved by checking out our website at www.environmentalsociety.ca. If you would like to receive email notification of events in the sustainability speaker series, you can send an email to the Saskatchewan Environmental Society. The email address is info, I-N-F-O, at environmentalsociety.ca. In your email message, ask to be put on the list of people to be notified of events in the sustainability speaker series. March 21st was International Day of Forests. This evening, our speaker is Michael Fitzsimmons, he has worked for the protection of forests, grasslands, and lakes and other Saskatchewan ecosystems over, for over 30 years. Michael has done scientific studies of Saskatchewan's boreal forest. He has a PhD in plant sciences from the University of Saskatchewan. Michael will describe the historic boreal forest of Saskatchewan and explain how its restoration would help meet the challenge of climate change. The title of Michael's presentation is Saskatchewan Forests and Natural Climate Solutions. Thank you, Carol, uh, for that introduction. Welcome to the webinar, and we'll be launching into a wide range of discussion of different topics related to the, the boreal forest in the past and also where the boreal forest might go in the future. So I'll try to share my screen now. 
So can anybody see that? It's taking a moment, a dramatic pause. We'll just give it a moment. Michael is located in a location with some internet, low internet bandwidth. So we're looking good, Michael. It's coming through. Okay. So I'm just trying to get my chat up because that my hope was that for some reason it's gone again. Um, And if, you, if we can't get the chat box up where you can see it, you can ask questions and I can always run my mouth. <laughs> yeah, for some reason I, oh, it's over here. Now I remember, okay. More chat. Okay, we're good now. Perfect. So um, you can see my presentation. So uh, we're going to talk about how forests may be able to contribute to the natural climate solutions. I think we're in a, in a dire position these days with climate breakdown. I think it's more than climate change. We're seeing climate breakdown. And I think the way we manage natural ecosystems can be a very efficient way to try to prevent climate change from getting as bad as it might. Uh, Branimir did a presentation earlier in this series and he talked a lot about how uh, Southern Saskatchewan ecosystems might be able to contribute that to that cause. And I'm gonna be talking about the, the boreal forest, at least the Southern parts of the boreal forest and how they might be used to mitigate against climate breakdown. So I've got a, a little bit of an outline here. Um, so we'll talk about the boreal forest and why it's important. We'll talk about the historic southern boreal forest of Saskatchewan. We'll talk about, you know, different trajectories that the forest, southern boreal forest might be able to be going in the future, depending on whether the status quo remains or, or whether we make some changes. Then I'll talk a little bit about how we get there from here, um, how we might get to some positive outcomes. And I'll just share my experience of working in these types of fields over the past 30 plus years. So I've added uh, some little windows down at the bottom of the presentation where I've asked a few questions. So if you want to answer the questions, you can just do that in the chat. And I'll, I'll, and I guess I will have my chat open. And if you come up with other questions as well, then, then feel free to, um, feel free to ask questions in the chat and I'll see what I can do to answer them. I won't be able to maybe answer them all, but if you do have a pertinent question to a particular slide, then go ahead with the chat. So my first question is what kind of leaves are these? So does anybody have any suggestions? Aspen, okay, I, I, I was at the top of my chat. I wasn't seeing the new stuff. So no doubt they're aspen leaves. And one of the ways you can tell that is the petiole or the, the stem of the leaf is as long as the leaf itself. And that's how you identify aspen leaves, a broad oval shape and a long leaf stem. So this is the Boreal Plains EcoZone. Can you see my mouse when I move it around the screen? Yes, we can. Okay. So um, this is the boreal plains in these sort of, I don't know, these are weird colors. I don't know what you call these, these green bands through here. So that's the boreal plains ecozone. And it's kind of sandwiched between the boreal shield, which is up here, 
and then the prairie ecozone, which is down here. So it's within, you know, it covers off every treaty area that we have in Saskatchewan, I believe. So four and five are down here, um, six through here, uh, eight up here, and 10 over here. So it covers uh, many different uh, Indigenous groups have occupied this land for a long period of time. So the way you kind of identify where the boreal plain starts and where the prairie sort of gives way is where precipitation exceeds evapotranspiration. And trees need that in order to grow, whereas grasses can do fine where precipitation is less than evapotranspiration. Evapotranspiration is the ev evaporation just from the sunlight and the hitting the ground or, or uh, hit, you know, vaporizing dew that might be on trees, but also the transpiration, which is the, the, um, the plants themselves basically pumping water in, into the atmosphere in order to take in carbon dioxide. So I've got a question here, should we have fire breaks through the boreal now? Well, we'll, we'll get to that quite a bit later. Um, so the mean annual temperature is very close to zero. Um, the primary tree species, the more common ones are black spruce, jack pine, trembling aspen, and white spruce. The, the secondary tree species, balsam fir, white birch, balsam poplar, and tamarack. And most of this area is all glacial till. So the glacier came down, scraped all the rocks off the boreal shield and pushed a bunch of dirt basically into this area. And as the glaciers retreated, they just left behind, you know, the soils as we see them. So the, I'll talk about two different species, uh, trembling aspen and black spruce. So the first one is trembling aspen. I, I call it Trembling aspen are life in the fast lane. It has the largest distribution of any tree in North America. Um, it's not really even a tree in a certain sense. Adjacent trees are not separate individuals. They're clones and they're connected underground. And from a DNA perspective, they're, up, they're not separate individuals. And the trees grow fast in full sun, but they die relatively long, young. So I'm talking about the individual tree stems, not the clone itself. Can regenerate well after spring fires because in the springtime, the soil is not that dry. So if a fire comes through in the spring, um, it, the, the roots are still alive and it can regenerate very well. It's used a lot by cavity nesters because relatively soft wood, although it's a deciduous tree. Deciduous trees are normally hardwoods, but it's a very soft wood uh, relative to most hardwood trees. The early spring growth is eaten by bears, you know, before the leaves come out, the catkins. And really one of the funniest things ever to see is a, a bear up on the top of a tree trying to get to the very tips of the tiniest branches to rub them through its mouth and uh, eat all the tips off the, the branches. Aspen was certainly, in terms of forestry, once considered a weed and is now exploited. So I asked what time of the years are clones easily visible? Somebody said this, the spring, but also, yeah, and when they turn color in the fall. So uh, you can see where the clones start and end because they they drop their leaves or they, they green up at each clone greens up, adjacent clones green up at different times. So black spruce I call life in the slow lane. They also have a wide distribution right across the boreal forest from Alaska to Newfoundland, but they can grow in sun or partial shade. They have a characteristic shape that it's because of squirrels. So the squirrels will come and eat the cones right near, not at the very top, but the most productive area for the cones is uh, 
just below the tip. So there's quite often a narrowing of, of the tree just below, below the tip. And there was a project done in, in Prince Albert National Park called Boreas, where NASA scientists came, came and did a remote sensing project to look at different ecosystems. And they found that old black spruce forests are the darkest ecosystems on earth that they had found to that time because the trees are like spires. They, they have very narrow crowns. So they don't have a nice flat reflective surface um, that can reflect sunlight back into space. Whereas you think of a poplar tree, all the branches try to meet each other. The crowns of the different trees try to meet each other and take advantage of the space. But black spruce trees uh, don't do that. They just stay in their narrow little um, spires. And my question is, what other type of conifers in the picture? Yes, jack pine is the, the right answer. So black spruce occupies lowland, moist lowland sites. It can grow in upland sites as well, but it's one of the most competitive species on the lowland sites. Conifer species in general tie up nutrients in fallen needles. Unlike the, the aspen leaves, which are very quick to decompose and feed their nutrients back in, into the tree or other plants, conifer needles lie on the ground for a long time and decomposition occurs very slowly. So this li limits nutrient availability and slows down the growth of the trees. In order to deal with this, black spruce have managed to keep their needles for a long time. So unlike uh, aspen that would um, that would recycle their leaves every year. Uh, um, black spruce will keep their needles for 15 years, so they definitely grow slower than aspen or even white spruce. But the trees can survive a long time. So uh, this is a study that that was done. Um, on a black spruce bog, bog near Lac La Ronge. And they tried to age the peat accumulation underneath of the black spruce bog. And they said that it went for 5,000 years. And there were black spruce needles throughout that core, the depth of that core that represented 5,000 years. It was two and a half meters deep. So I got a question about this map. One thing about this map is the, lat the latitudes can't be right here because this should be higher than this. So probably 54 degrees, 45 minutes. So boreal forests change a lot, you know, over that deglaciation time. And uh, this is a pollen analysis. And you can see in the early days, poplar was the first species to come back very abundantly. And then spruce took over, probably took them longer to get here. They don't disperse as fast. And then birch was more abundant for several thousand years than it ever has been since. Grasses were also really abundant around 5,000 years ago. They call it the hypsithermal warm period. And you know, in the last 3,000 years or so, it's been the modern vegetation with uh, spruce, pine, poplar. It shows betula in this case as being very strong. That might be a local phenomenon for this lake, um, which is north northwest of Lloydminster. Um, but also, it, it's not equal that every species has the same gives off the same amount of pollen. So. So the boreal forest is a globally important ecosystem, has many functions. It's occupied by indigenous nations and is important to their livelihood. It's a storehouse of fixed atmospheric carbon. It attenuates runoff and releases water to the atmosphere. It's important wildlife habitat, both for local species and for migratory species, some of which migrate as far as Central and South America. So we've talked about the boreal forest and why it's important. 
So we'll move on to the historic boreal forest of Saskatchewan. So indeed, uh, it, it's been inhabited for a very long time by Cree, Dene, and other indigenous populations. And they lived off the wild biota, including fish, wildlife, berries, trees, and other, other plants. They continue to utilize this natural productivity, but have been alienated from much of the southern boreal region by land privatization. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. So historically, the southern boreal forest trees were probably larger in a lot of cases than maybe they are today in your typical forest operation. Um, if you open any history book, local history book of a forest uh, community that was in the forest, you'll, they'll have old pictures of these giant trees that they took out at the time of settlement. But the boreal forest was also much, I'm going to show you a comparison of, this is just a current Google Earth image that I, that I got for all of Saskatchewan. And I overlaid it with Stan Rowe's Forest Regions of Canada map from 1959. And I just want to focus in on a few elements um, what we might call forest islands or peninsulas, Riding Mountain in Manitoba, Duck Mountains in Manitoba and Saskatchewan, the Porcupine Hills, the Pasqua Hills, Fort Alicorn. There's a Nisbet Forest, but it's kind of covered up by the word Saskatchewan. And this is the south end of Prince Albert National Park. So here is uh, Stan Rowe's uh, Forest Regions of Canada. Stan Rowe being a longtime professor at the University of Saskatchewan and a, and a great ecologist. And here, if you overlay them, you'll see the true, he called this sort of the true boreal, probably conifer dominated here. And then this is what he called forest and grass. So probably aspen with uh, meadow opening, grass meadow openings. You can see all of these areas were once connected in the actual boreal forest. So Riding Mountain, the Duck Mountains, Fort Alicorn, they were not islands. These peninsulas were not really peninsulas. This is agricultural land clearing that's happened all through this area. And this is the south end of Prince Albert National Park. And you can see there's quite an abrupt boundary where the agricultural land stop and the park starts. So I asked a question earlier about why did these, why did these pieces of forest remain? Well, the names kind of give this away, mountains and hills at higher elevations, it's colder, damper, the trees do better and agriculture doesn't work very well. And yes, I got soil is sandy here in the chat and you're right, Fort Alicorn, the Nisbet Forest, are extremely sandy and just weren't suitable for agriculture. The south of Prince Albert National Park, I'll talk a little bit about that, that later. So there was a debate back in the 1920s, Merle Massey writes about this in uh, the book Forest Prairie Edge. And the debate was whether forest land was better, better maintained as forest or converted to agriculture. At the time, land conversion was in full swing and moving north. In the, in the Department of Interior, this debate occurred and they decided to set aside a large area as a Sturgeon Lake Forest Reserve. And you think of a forest reserve would be reserved from forestry, but it wasn't reserved from forestry. Forestry went on, forest harvesting went on. And, but it was, agri it was reserved from agricultural development. And eventually much of this reserve was turned into Prince Albert National Park. So that's why the agricultural land conversion stopped at Prince Albert National Park. So I did my graduate research looking at what are the carbon impacts of deforestation. So I did this work in 2001 and I compared sites that were still forested in Prince Albert National Park, sites just, just 
a few hundred meters away or within a kilometer that were converted to pasture in the 1950s. And then areas a little ways further away that were converted to cultivation in the 1930s. And I estimated the loss of carbon. This is a box and whisker diagrams. These would be the median carbon levels for forests would be about 160, say, whereas for pasture and cultivated, they were down around 75. So they lost, you know, about half of the, the carbon was lost at these sites by stripping the trees off. The, the, the soil carbon didn't change that much. So this is megagrams. What's a megagram? That's a, that's a million grams to a thousand kilograms or a metric ton. And a hectare, how big is a hectare? A hectare is 100 meters by 100 meters. Uh, it takes 100 hectares to make a, a square kilometer. And it takes about two and a half acres to make a hectare. So the historic southern boreal forest was managed primarily for extraction. And despite the fact that forests are supposed to be a renewable resource and there's companies that are supposed to make long-term commitments to harvesting and regeneration, the true history is that American forestry companies have entered Saskatchewan over a long period of time from the Prince Albert Lumber Company close to the turn of the century, the early 1900s, to Parsons and Whittemore that first built the pulp mill, Simpson Timber that operated over by Hudson Bay, Weyerhaeuser Canada that took over uh, the mill. All of them have left their, their uh, management areas because they lost markets, they ran out of trees, or they found more profitable places to operate. So the, the other thing I'd like to talk about is how forest products have changed, and this has implications for carbon. So there's been a declining quality and permanence of forest products. If you think back to the early 1900s to today over the past 100 years, you know, we first looked at lumber and gradually got into plywood, pulp, oriented strand board, paper, particle board. And it seems like we're having to shave the wood into smaller and smaller pieces, use smaller trees, add more glue and chemicals over time. And, and the actual forest products have less carbon content and more embedded energy. What I mean is how much energy did it take to produce that product? And I, I would think that, you know, producing particle board takes more energy than an equivalent size piece of, of lumber. Now, I'll just give you a quick example of this. In the 1920s, they used clear fir uh, floor joists then they came up with these engineering, engineered web floor trusses. And now they have oriented strand board, uh, board eye joists. And here's some pictures of them. So here's older houses, say in the 1920s, they'd be built with this uh, solid fur uh, floor joist. This is what my house was like. My house is built in 1980 and it has this webbed uh, it's a lot less wood and more steel. Steel has a lot more um, carbon content because it takes a lot of carbon emissions to make steel. And then here's the modern, today the I-beams or I-joists that are made out of oriented strand board and some lumber. And you can see, you know, in this pile of wood, it's mostly oriented strand board. So we'll talk about that a little bit later again. So we've talked about the historic southern boreal forest. Now I want to talk about the potential future southern boreal forest. So I'll start with talking about forestry. So this is the Prince Albert Forest Management Area. So there's a consortium of companies, Sakao Aski that has an agreement with the provincial government to manage this area. It's a very large area going all the way from La Ronge down to Big River, all the way over to Candle Lake uh, and all, you know, quite a ways around there. 
So this is the age distribution of the forest. So these bars represent how much area of trees are in different ages. So there's less than 100,000 trees that are 10 years or less in age, whereas there's well over twice as much of that, that's 20 years of age. And then it declines, but then there's a large pulse of older forests between say 80 and 140 years old. So the forest management plan that's been agreed on by the province allows the replacement of those high biomass and high biodiversity mature and old forests with lower biomass and lower biodiversity young forests. So they basically, they want to manage the forest such that all these bars are reduced down to this red line. And this red line is this theoretical, it's called the negative exponential curve that you'd get with a 55 year fire cycle. So foresters don't like these old forests. Um, this is great habitat. Um, they call it over mature or decadent, but these areas are rich in biodiversity. You can see they have old trees, they have young trees, they have conifers and deciduous trees. They have dead snags, fungi, you can see fungi growing, a lot of downed logs, a lot of decomposer organisms that, that other animals will eat. So they're, it's a very rich habitat for biodiversity. So they want to get rid of they want to get rid of those old forests and replace them with younger forests. I think my slides have moved around for some reason. There we go. Um, and I think old forests are irreplaceable with any meaningful time frame. If you want to create a young forest. You can create a young forest in one season or one year. You can create young forest. If you want to create an old forest, it takes you a hundred years to do that. So they're not quite equivalent. If people in the future value mature and old stands, then that takes them a century to recreate them. But by liquidating them, you're taking away options from future generations. So the forest industry assumes that it's actually good for carbon to strip all these old trees down because they're kind of rotting anyways and decomposing anyways. And we'll turn those into forest products. And these forest products will be a, a carbon pool of their own that will last for a long time. And intuitively, you know, I don't have any data, but intuitively that just doesn't make a lot of sense to me. You take a clear cut like this, you've stripped off all those trees, hauled them away, but what were they made into? You know, and there's, say they're used for pulp. What happens while you're in the process of making pulp? Well, what are all the activities you have to do? You have to lay out the cut blocks, you gotta build roads and culverts, you have to harvest the logs, you have to reforest the site, decommission the roads, all the logs to the mill, process them into pulp or chips or whatever they're made into. You have to haul to wherever the processor of the final product is. Pulp is not a final product. Say they have to process them into final products like paper cups or whatever they're used for, cardboard boxes. Then you have to deliver them to their end use destination. You have to haul them to the landfill when they, when they become waste. And you have to, de they decompose in the landfill and may give off greenhouse gases in decomposition. If instead of harvesting that site, a fire had gone through, the fire doesn't take away all those tree stems. It burns the needles off and a bit of the bark, but a lot of that, the boles of the trees are remained. 
So I had asked a question earlier about how, how long forest products last, and somebody said they have wooden dishes, they last for decades. It's true. But the main products we're making usually aren't wooden dishes. So I don't know, I'm, I'm suspect of this, this argument. So I'm going to move on from talking about forestry in the provincial forest to talk about what's happening to the forest in the what you might call the agricultural zone, although it's still that area that was the, in the land that could be true boreal forest. So here's an example that I found just in 2019. You can see the heavy equipment lined up and they're knocking down all of these trees in order to convert it to agricultural land. And this is just south of the boundary of the Northern Provincial Forest, northeast of Prince Albert. So deforestation is when you knock down a forest, but unlike in forestry where you reforest it, it's actually maintained as non-forest through cultivation or some other form of disturbance, grazing, uh, could be road building. So deforested sites are not allowed to return to a, a forest state. And here's, here's another picture. And I, I just threw this on, we keep hearing, oh, there's gotta be a price on carbon. Well, there's no price on this carbon. Nobody pays anything except perhaps the fuel you use in those machines to knock down all the trees, which has its own carbon emissions. There's no policy, there's no regulations that inhibit anybody from doing this to forests. So forests have declined across Saskatchewan due to agricultural land conversion. So in this case, they've actually grown a crop here. They didn't even wait to clear all the wood away. They're actually seeding in between these windrows of trees. I don't know if you can see what crop that is. Here's another shot. And you can see that they're growing. This is actually canola that they're growing. And canola, you know, from my perspective, is probably one of the worst crops from a carbon emission perspective because it requires lots of inputs, lots of fertilizer, lots of spraying. So it, you, they, they make a lot of passes. And so it, it has a, also has a lot of embedded energy in it. But the same would be the case if, if it was a grazed area. If you were to turn this area into a pasture, and there's actually lots of pastures, lots of cattle in the southern boreal forest region. And they too are prevented from coming back to trees by cattle grazing. And Again, those areas don't provide any long lasting ongoing uh, carbon storage in terms of the products. And actually the grazing doesn't actually build up uh, carbon in the soil as much as you know theoretically it might. When I did my study, a grazed pasture had no more carbon in it in the soil than a cultivated site. So I'm going back to this issue of privatization of land and alienation from use by Indigenous people. So Treaty 6, for example, was signed in 1876, and it prescribed that the Indigenous signatories shall have the right to pursue their avocations of hunting and fishing through the tracts surrendered, as herein before described, subject to such regulations as may from time to time be made by her government of her dominion of Canada and saving and accepting such tracts as may from time to time be required or taken up for settlement, mining, lumbering, or other purposes. And I added the emphasis of that. It's almost written as if it's gonna rarely happen, you know, from time to time this might happen, but otherwise you'll be able to hunt and fish throughout the, the tract of land. And I mean, clearly for the Southern Boreal Forest, this hasn't been the case. Well, for all of Southern Saskatchewan, all the prairie land as well. So when, once you privatize the land, 
uh, it's difficult to maintain access. So this is a report that was done called Missing Pathways to 1.5. How can we use land to try to mitigate against uh, climate breakdown? And it notes that deforestation globally has cost, caused 30% of the carbon dioxide emissions to the atmosphere. So the majority of carbon, carbon dioxide emissions are from fossil fuel burning, but a full 30% come from the loss of forests over the last century. So afforestation, so I talked about deforestation, afforestation is its reverse. And so you try to put a forest back on land that hasn't had a forest on it for a long time. And that could make a significant contribution to sequestering enough carbon to reduce the effects of climate change. And as well as afforestation, by halting deforestation, restoring degraded forest ecosystems, this would dramatically enhance natural carbon sinks and would be a, a, a good approach to mitigating against climate change. So we think of deforestation as being a tropical phenomenon. We think about the, the Amazon and uh, Borneo and places like that. But deforestation has a long history in Canada. And over the past 10 years, they estimated that 40,000 hectares per year in Canada were deforested. So if you assume 100 trees per hectare, that's 40 million trees lost. And this is kind of a handicap. There's been this initiative by the federal government to plant 2 billion trees. Well, already they're 40, not 40 over 10 years. And already there are 40 million trees down because of uh, deforestation that occurs. And as I mentioned before, there is no price on carbon in terms of destroying a standing forest. So this is how the government is going about doing this two billion tree program. So this is just, I, I copied this off their website. You know, who wants to get involved? Do you have some land for tree planting? Do you have any trees? Are you looking to invest in a tree planting initiative? Are you a nursery operator looking to grow the demand for seedlings? So it's a very much a voluntary approach um, they're not doing any direct government programs to move this forward. They're just providing funding. And I think that's a real challenge. Can anybody think of any, any other ways that the government might approach doing this? In the meantime, I'll just add a couple of, uh, answer a couple of questions here. So I measured soil carbon about 50 years after it had been, um, been turned into pasture and 70 years after it was turned into um, cultivated land. So from my, my perspective, I think the government's changed its approach. Earlier in the century when land was needed for what, whatever it was needed for, military bases, experimental farms, national parks, airports, or other, other government purposes, the government acquired land. But today there's real resistance against doing that, sort of the sanctity of private land. Today the approach for environmental issues at least, is not even considering acquiring land and funding is only provided for projects on the people that put forward a project voluntarily. I think that really limits how far we're gonna get with this initiative, but also it reduces the accountability of government. If government takes direct control of a project and says it's gonna store carbon in the landscape, then they're accountable for the results. But if they just put a bunch of money out there for to be used by third parties, then if 
some of these projects fail, the, the government can just say, well, we provided the funds, you know, must have been some other group that, that failed. So let's just think about what we could do with that, that 2 billion trees. How many of that 2 billion would we get? Saskatchewan has 3% of the Canadian population, but we have 6% of Canada's forests. Let's assume that we get 6% of that 2 billion trees. We'd have 120 million trees to plant over 10 years, which would allow us at 100 trees per hectare to plant 1.2 million hectares, almost 3 million acres. So we could do this in a haphazard manner through these voluntary programs, or we could try to do it in a strategic way that maximize the, the benefits for biodiversity and carbon. So this is the Fort Alicorn Provincial Forest, which I mentioned was now an island, wasn't originally an island. What if we wanted to connect that, those, that back to the contiguous boreal forest? That area is about 130,000 hectares between the Fort Alicorn Provincial Forest and the Northern Provincial Forest. Let's assume that 70% of that land needs to be afforested. The rest would be wetlands or it's already still forested. That's 91,000 hectares times 100 trees per hectare. That's nine, 9 million trees. That's less than 10% of the 120 million trees available. Even if you had to plant twice as many trees, thinking that some of them, um, some of the trees would die, you'd still, it's still very feasible to do something like that. So I've got a comment here about creating easements on private land for a long-term afforestation. That's certainly possible. And those kind of agreements would, would be a good idea. I just don't necessarily sense that, I don't know, there's very strong commitment by the government to these things over the long term. So rather than creating large areas of young growing trees by truncating the age structure of the provincial forest, by increasing the harvesting as we've shown that they wanna do uh, in the Prince Albert FMA, and assume that forest products will result in carbon sequestration, Saskatchewan could feasibly connect all of the island forests back to the northern provincial forest through afforestation. This would increase carbon stocks, it would increase ecological connectivity, and make more boreal forests available to provide the important functions uh, talked about earlier. So that miss, missing pathways report that I talked about it also talks about the issue of equitability and who has access to land. And the conversion of public land to private land over the last century has made most of Southern Saskatchewan private property, which is now automatically no trespassing. If we're able to convert some of that private non-forest land to public forest land, we would help reverse that trend. There's assumption that private land Land that's been privatized can never be returned to the public realm. And that's not true. Private land can become pub public land as easy as public land can become private land. The examples of this are some national parks like Grasslands National Park were created on private land, national wildlife areas, uh, St. Denis National Wildlife Area, for example. Most PFRA pastures were once uh, homesteaded. Some military bases were acquired when the need arose. So I think we need to get over this issue that nothing can happen on private land uh, with government intervention. So the question we move on to next is how we get there from here. And when I first went to university in the 1970s, I took a theoretical math course, and I don't know why, but I had a professor and he said, you have to let your imagination run wild. And that's what I'm gonna ask you to do. I'm not gonna be constrained by issues like what's politically feasible or what's financially feasible. I think we just need to talk 
free thinking to think about what we could do to try to um, stop climate breakdown from occurring. I think, first of all, we need to give up the search for a scientific or technological breakthrough. Stan Rowe, again, the, a great ecologist who taught it many years in the, in the plant ecology department at the University of Saskatchewan, he said, science will take us in whatever direction we choose toward worthy and unworthy goals with equal faculty. The Government of Canada through the Canadian Forest Service tries to provide research and innovation. And I think the underlying assumption of that is that we can solve our problems through, through finding technological solutions, the techno fix. And I, I just don't buy that. Really, it's a values problem. It's an ethics problem. And way back in 1944, Richard St. Barr Baker was one of the first graduates of what became the University of Saskatchewan, said wood may be regarded as merely a byproduct of trees. Their greatest value is probably their beneficial effect upon life, health, climate, soil, rainfall, and streams. And nowadays we'd add to that, you know, it mentions climate, I guess the way it would affect climate is through that carbon sequestration. Uh, Paul Hanley of Saskin recently wrote a book about Richard St. Barr Baker and it's a great read. Paul Hanley also wrote a, another book called Eleven and he, pre pre he presents in there a value continuum and this is just part of it, but he talks about how society, a lot of societal activities are around frivolous and unnecessary things instead of constructive and necessary things. And if I look back, I had mentioned about how forest products have changed. You know, we used to have more durable forest products, dimensional lumber and plywood. Now we have a lot of frivolous and unnecessary products, paper cups and pizza boxes. So I, I would add one thing to this sort of value continuum with regard to the carbon content of forest products. And that is we're better off creating permanent forest products or long lasting durable forest products than temporary disposable forest products. So that's only part of the, the value continuum. He also has below frivolous and unnecessary, he has destructive. And I guess I'd have to put deforestation back on the, even outside of this part, that part that I've shown of this continuum in the destructive part. So how do we achieve some of these value changes. First of all, we have to put pressure on governments and corporations. That would be a top-down approach, get them to require production of lasting forest products and set aside more areas from extraction. But there's also a, a bottom-up approach that's required and that is consumers need to reject and reduce things like disposable forest products. We shouldn't be stopping at Tim Hortons twice a day for our our uh, drive through coffee in a disposable cup. And I don't, I'm not trying to be judgmental about this. I'm as much a participant in society as everyone else is. And um, interesting, someone just mentioned this book, Braiding, Braiding Sweetgrass, and my next slide was about that. Um, So we need to start changing our values. And one way to think about it is consider more the indigenous worldview. And in that very book that was mentioned in the chat there, um, Robin Wall Kimmerer in her book, Braiding Sweetgrass, she came up with some principles of what she called honorable harvest. I won't go through them all, but harvest in a way that minimizes harm. Use it respectfully and never waste what you have taken. Share. 
Give thanks for what you have been given. Sustain the ones who sustain you and the earth will last forever. And I think that kind of thinking is, is really, we have to give that really serious consideration in terms of how we move forward to manage ourselves, uh, our, the people we coexist with in society and the environment. So another thinker um, is Ursula Franklin. She was a physicist at the University of Toronto uh, decades ago. She was a brilliant thinker. She talked about the difference between divisible and indivisible benefits and divisible and indivisible costs. So examples of divisible, indivisible benefits are public peace, justice, clean air and water. There's no way to divide that up and say, I get this much of peace and, and I get more peace than you get. Um, if you provide peace effectively, uh, you provide clean air, everyone has access to clean air. And if you were to provide carbon sinks, then not everyone would benefit from that, not just a small group who would be able to divide it amongst themselves. And it's really up to government to provide these indivisible benefits. Whereas oftentimes the public purse is used to make, make resources, publicly owned resources available to the private sector so they can turn it into divisible benefits and the governments fail to protect those indivisible benefits. So we shouldn't be afraid to advocate or public interest over private interests. Forests were once considered part of the commons. The Charter of the Forest was a companion document to the Magna Carta in, in Britain. It served as one of the first legal limitations on privatization by granting commoners a formal right of access to the collective resources that were fundamental to the human, to human survival. The king wasn't able to uh, keep all the resources to himself. I think forest carbon sequestration could be, should be considered a collective resource that's fundamental for human survival. And forests should be protected by governments, not squandered by market forces. So another thing that I think we need to change is we need to give up this idea that there's win-win solutions to all environmental problems. I guess one of the biggest changes I've noticed since when I went to school in the 1970s to the way people are trained today, you were allowed to have an advers adversarial approach on environmental issues back then. And nowadays everyone wants um, you, know, you to find win-win solutions and win over people with different interests than what you have. And you think of the earliest environmental battles around, for example, dangerous chemicals, DDT, 245T dioxin, lead in gasoline. These were outright banned. They didn't, um, the preferred approach was not to find a, a half measure solution that would benefit both the public and the industry. The real world in my mind is about trade-offs. And I don't think anything positive for the environment can be achieved without society sacrificing something. So you can't say, oh, here's the environmental solution. We can do this and nobody loses anything. Everybody gains. That's not really the case. So as I said, we mustn't be afraid to advocate for indivisible benefits. No one else will. The environment can't advocate for its own the climate the air, the forest can't advocate for its own. So I recently read a book by Malcolm Squires, Dynamic Forest, it's about the boreal forest. And he quoted in there, he's an industrial forester, but still he said forest management is about balancing competing interests and an action that satisfy the needs of one person may and usually does damage the interest of others. Competing interests include the province, First Nations, forestry, tourism, mining, energy, and transportation industries, 
etc. And I think, although he's, he's an industrial forest forester and he approaches things from a commercial forestry production perspective, I think he's being realistic in saying these interests do compete with each other. And so we need to advocate that some of the individual benef indivisible benefits like carbon sequestration need to get more attention. And that means somebody's gonna give up something. Some company has to give up some production in order to make that occur. And I think we need the courage to be bold and not limit what we think might be possible. So George Woodwell was the chairperson of the World Commission on Forests, which was set up by the United Nations. And way back in 2001, 20 years ago, he said, the world has filled, land and other resources are more and more intensively contested. Compromises that could be reached in an earlier time are no longer possible. In these circumstances, a new set of considerations enters the public realm, one that has more to do with what will work in a biophysical sense than what will work in an economic or political sense. And that's what I think we need to um, think about climate change. We have to think what will work to get the climate back on track. And this will require all kinds of economic, political, um, industrial changes. So, <clears throat> so, and one of the ways we could do this is protect more forests because a natural forest acts in some way as a carbon sink Perhaps not forever, the stand breaks down eventually and releases more carbon. But the very fact that you have a protected area, you're not, um, you're not running equipment over it. You're not building roads. You're not uh, hauling away the timber. Um, so you're, you're avoiding a lot of emissions just by protecting it. So I would, say the most profound conservation measure for the boreal forest happened in the 1920s prior to the federal provincial land transfer agreement. Wood Buffalo, Prince Albert and Riding Mountain National Parks were, were established in the 1920s and set aside from, for the most part from uh, industrial forestry. And although where mistakes were made when they set aside these lands, they also restricted access by indigenous nations. And I, and I hope that this is, uh, this land is made more accessible to them in the future. But these, are, these areas have been largely free of industrial resource extraction. And I think our forests need protection both within forest management agreement areas, like I showed uh, the Prince Albert forest management area and also within agricultural landscapes to serve a function as carbon reserves. So in summary, we discussed today the importance of the boreal forest as a carbon sink. We noted how the boreal forest carbon stocks declined with agricultural land conversion. We talked about the potential future boreal forest uh, that might occur if we don't keep liquidating the carbon content of the forest through excessive harvesting and further agricultural deforestation. And finally, we talked about some approaches that will be required to prevent climate breakdown. So I wanted to thank Saskatchewan Environmental Society and the Public Library for inviting me to do this presentation. I wanna thank Colleen Watson Turner for sharing her photographs graphs, and thank Bell Drummond for her research insights, uh, some of the work about the forest management plans and the, the, the age class distributions and the fire cycles.
uh, that information was first brought to my attention by Bell Drummond. So I guess we'll open this up for questions. I'm going to stop sharing my screen here.